Mike was not from a lineage of coaches. His, you know, his, his parents didn't coach sports. So going in, he's coaching against all these other more established coaches. But there's always been a, a humble, quiet confidence that he has had in whatever he's attempted to do, that he was going to do it at a high level. I don't remember him boasting. He just kind of looked quietly, very perceptive. But in his mind, he's, a, he's an assassin. One day, I was in my office and I get a call from CIF and uh, they asked me if I would uh, come and be on the advisory board. And we had won about, I think we were maybe four, four or five championships in by now and a couple of state championships, so we were really rolling. And uh, so I said, yes, absolutely, I'd be honored to do that. So I go down and I'm part of these meetings and, um, you know, I look around and in the meetings, I'm having to defend the success we're having with uh, the advisory board members. I, I would make the joke that, you know, CIF should call the open division the Mike Lynch division, right? Um, because of so much success that Price had and, and particularly considered a small school, uh, I think there was no doubt about it that him and maybe a few others because of their success, uh, a jealousy factor kind of like, you know, grew out of that and really re uh, jiggered the way that CIF creates uh, the divisions. Questions kept coming up about how do we, they didn't say how do we stop this, but how do we get some, how do we uh, become more equitable uh, so that other teams would win, other schools would win? And um, so they literally are trying to come up with rules to, uh, in my opinion, stop the runs. And I understood it on one end, but I didn't uh, understand why wouldn't they find out why the programs are successful so that other programs could model that maybe and uh, become successful themselves. Uh, so ultimately, they ended up coming up with an equity rule. And um, uh, but by that time, I had chosen to step down from the advisory board. Those young people that, that he had, particularly at Price, right, they, he offered them this unbelievable opportunity to play some high-level basketball, to get a high-level education, and to really see themselves as succeeding post-high school. Like, I shudder to think, like, had there not been uh, Mike, had there not been Price, like, with those opportunities in that same community, you know, we're, we're very aware of South Los Angeles and some of its historical, you know, pitfalls for particularly for young black men. Um, you know, Mike was a person that gave a gateway uh, to success for those young people. And, it, and, it's, and it's put in their history books because they won titles. Price is jumping up and down on the sideline. They are five seconds away. Jalen Woods has it three seconds, two seconds, and that is it. Your final, Price 69. Francis Parker, 48. But the reality of it is uh, Mike built something unbelievably special. It was a, a beacon of hope in the community in South Los Angeles. And young men that were talented beyond just basketball came, signed up, and played for him. In, a, in an era uh, that was really about like kind of like individual kind of accolades, um, I'm so impressed uh, that beyond the collection of talent that they had at, at, at Price and even here at LaSalle, he always got his teams to play together. Um, and um, for anyone that you know wanted to kind of like push back on that or had the rules change, I think they really missed that lesson in, his, in the history of his of his career. You know, when you play for some coaches, there's like a little bit of fear or like them yelling at you or, you know, as you're coming up from ninth grade to your senior year. But I think it was more so of a not wanting to let him down type of thing. So I think that motivation was a little bit different than other coaches. Um, and I think that's where a coach like really excels. You know, he's one of those coaches that he believes in a system um, as far as running plays, things like that. But for the most part, he lets you do you. The offense breaks, you know, you freestyle, do your thing. So he, he lets you play a game and not hold you back like, you know, some coaches do. We just respect it. 
coach program so much because it was about winning and it was serious and we, we felt that we wanted to be a part of that. We, didn't, we sacrificed everything. We don't care about nothing else, but we want to win with this man. They may go back to that zone. I don't know yet. I don't know yet, but if they do, we're going over the like All of his players and you know the other coaches, everybody respected him, but he also you know, treated everybody fairly. You know, he was, he'd get on you, but at the same time, he like right after he got on you, he like encouraged you, support you if you did things good, did things well, but he also will hold you accountable. So it was definitely a different culture coming here. And it just, it, it made, he made you want to play hard, like run through a wall for him. There was so many times where he would, we'd be out here practicing and he'd say something to me like, I'm thinking I'm going hard. I'm thinking I'm doing my best. And he's like, you got some more in you. You got some more in you, big fella. He was, it was just a, he was just a great presence and a great um, male figure that I needed, an additional male figure that I needed in my life at that time, um, you know. And he really taught me a lot just off and off the, on and off the court about just how to conduct yourself, how to do things. If you're going to be good, you got to put in the work, but you also have to, you know, you know, take care of yourself outside, take care of your business outside of sports, you know, all those things, right? He was able to find ways to teach life lessons just with, you know, the X's and O's and, you know, the, the game of basketball itself. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed my time, you know, uh, playing for Coach Lynch. And I, I wish, my only regret is that I didn't play here all four years. He instilled, you know, team basketball. This is this is team game. And that was great to be a part of not just him as my coach, but coach slash godfather between me and him. And to bring a state championship to Price was, that's all I ever wanted to do. Shot blocked by Booker. Trehecke outlet to Crab. Crab's open, dunk. In my um, sophomore year, um, the girls team, the girls coach was let go. Um, as I was getting ready to play sophomore year basketball and I was like at a crossroads because I couldn't imagine going a season without playing basketball. And my goal was to play basketball in college and I was thinking I can't have a year where I'm not playing at all. And coach comes to me and says, just stick it out. I will find a coach for you. I know it's going to be tough. Just, just stick it out. Um, and I trusted him. I stayed. Um, and so coach stayed true to his word. He got a coach in there the next year. Fully supported him to make sure that he had what he needed. Um, went on to have a really great season, but it was because of him. If, if, if coach had never said, anything, I wouldn't have been at Price. Our dad being the best dressed coach, high school coach, especially high school, because you know, you're so used to seeing college coaches come out in suits, but it was just not normal for a high school basketball coach to be in a three-piece suit. Um, but as long as I can remember, my dad has dressed, yeah. um, even in his job as a police officer. And when he came out of the uniform and became a detective, he put on a suit. And so he, I, you knew that he was going to be fitted, yeah. and you knew he was going to smell good. Yeah. My dad has worn, I mean, I'm a perfume lover because of him. He smelled good and he looked good. He yeah. was not going to walk out that house any other way. Even in my household, everybody's like, man, your coaching staff is well-dressed. I think that sets the tone for everything like top down, right? Like crisp to the point, um, like I was talking about his just aura, his boldness, his demand of excellence. Like, I think that just the way he was dressing, everything sharp to the T. Coach definitely knew how to, definitely knew how to put it on, man. I mean, it's funny because you see most high school coaches, they'll just come to the game and like the school issue, like, sweatsuit or something but he came suited and booted i mean it was rare that you saw a coach you know put the same suit into rotation it just seemed like it was a new suit every game man like you know he always kept the suit jacket on but you know when the game got tight or he was he was getting pissed that jacket came off and everybody knew oh dang the jacket came off you know it's business time or something's not right but my dad had always been the type where if there was like a, you know Time change and everybody was wearing the slimmer fit pants and all that. He doesn't, he always says he sets the trends, the trends follow him. So 
he would, you know, he wore the, where his pants were big at the bottom. He did that was his thing. He just was, he wasn't following any trend. It was what he thought yeah. looked good, that's what he wore. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't, we still he doesn't, don't know where he gets his yeah, things. He calls from. it his spots. Yeah. Downtown, you, know, yeah. You, don't, you don't know. Mike and I went to the same spot to buy suits. So I was buying suits because I was working on Wall Street at the time or in finance. Mike was buying suits because he's the best dressed high school basketball coach in Southern California. You know, I understand coach likes to not let people know where that is. So I'm not going to put that name on camera, but just I know where Mike gets his suits. You don't get to pick up a suit, but you can give him money to, to go up. get his suit. Yeah. That's all he's going to ask for. Yeah. Just yeah. leave me some cash and right. let me go do my thing yeah. and, and I'll be back. Yeah. Because <laughs> I also think he didn't want anybody to know how much it costs. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he just <laughs> slides money and then he'll go get his stuff. So I for sure would say definitely best dress coach in high school in the state. Personally, he, he had me impressed every home game, you know. He he was always looking right. One day he brought out um, the blue suit. He, he told me something about some Philadelphia blues and I was wondering like, dang, he, he was really dripped out, I won't lie. <laughs> After a, a tough loss, you knew to give him, he needed at least an hour to, to calm down the loss of steam. But um, the unique thing about me and my dad is that I call myself his assistant coach on the on the stands. And so every time, after every single game, it doesn't matter if I'm here, if I watch it online, if I was there in person, we, we have to debrief. And that means that I tell him everything that I felt like he did wrong, that I would have done differently. <laughs> and so we get the argument, I'm like, Dad, you should have substituted this person for that person. You know, you call the timeout too late, they're on a roll. And so we would go back and forth and it would, without, fail he would always say at the end of the conversation how many rings do you have and then that just shut the whole thing down because i was you know i don't have any you don't know if right the, i mean every time so and i feel like there was a early part of his coaching career where yeah. the anger and the emotion was so strong yeah like winning meant you know losing meant like a death to him yeah. we called it funeral services that he had after every loss and at the beginning it would be like two weeks at the end here, it was like maybe an evening, and then the next day he was, you know, he was back at it. So, uh, you know, it was a process, but he never is good with losing. He could tell you his losing stat just as quickly as he could tell you his wins, because he don't like the numbers <laughs> for losing. During my 19 years at Price, coaching the guys, um, We'd oftentimes have, uh, the school would have some financial issues. There would be years where I'd hear, man, you know what, uh, we're close to closing down. And uh, I'll never forget uh, Mrs. Evans, the uh, uh, president, founder of the school. Uh, we'd talk and we'd pray and God would always move. And so the school just kept plugging along, plugging along. And uh, at the very end there, after the 19th season, I was told that school's closing down for real. I understood that they actually voted to close the high school portion of the school. So at that time, um, I still wanted to coach. I was contacted by uh, Coach Tucker from uh, Pasadena. And um, he said, um, hey, I know you would never leave Price, but um, there's a job that's available out here at a Catholic school. And uh, LaSalle High School ended up being the school. And I told him, I said, man, this is, this is strange. The timing is just amazing. I said, we're closing down over here. Uh, so he said, you want me to throw your name in the hat? I said, do that. And lo and behold, I ended up getting a job at LaSalle after going through a short process and um, ended up signing a contract, meeting the families and uh, young men that were going to be returning and uh, having a press conference, the whole, whole, whole shebang. And um, shortly thereafter, 
I was told that the school, once again, was going to remain open. Uh, but at that time, I was fully committed. Mike Lynch, as an employee of Crenshaw Christian Center and Frederick Price Schools, was a dream. He was just a, a, a blessing to have as an employee. He was um, a person who had staff under him, had players under him, yet he himself was a man under authority. There were times when he may not have agreed with me as his superior, yet he was comfortable letting me know that. But he, and he always did it respectfully and I never felt like he was you know, putting me down or anything like that. And, and I like that about him because some people won't do that. Your employees oftentimes won't do that. And that's, you know, that's not good. Mike is literally, he's, he's one of very few people that I know that are operating in their purpose and was blessed to be able to walk that with his passion. So just, I, I would watch him in a huddle with the guys before the game, and I would literally get, almost get jealous. Cause I'd be like, man, I want that. I wanna be, ooh, I just wanna be so fulfilled like he is, you know? I think the, uh, the most challenging thing is it is that you literally have to let go of a part of yourself, uh, the family does, because Mike's purpose, I believe, is to young men who are fatherless. Now, some of these young men have a father in the home with them, but they are still fatherless. And so Mike has always, to me, he even attracts those kind of young men to him. Um, and so, uh, now, and then on the other hand, he had um, the young men who were in single, uh, you know, just their mother. And so because he's such a father role, because he, he is who he is, they tend to look at him, you know, like these young man's fathers. So, you know, sometimes that became a challenge. Um, in fact, we had to, um, I had to implement a 10 p.m. rule in the house. I said because, you know, he would be inundated with, you know, calls from all of these moms who wanted to talk to him, you know, my son is doing this, and it would be off the court, you know, stuff that fathers do. Um, so, uh, so that was the challenging part, and you know, we had to grow through that, you know, because, you know, I was a young wife, you know, and so there were still those, you know, those regular insecurities, but, you know, we grew to it to the point where it, twice we had young men living with us, um, you know, to, to help. Uh, the, the rewarding thing is that I have all of these children. I have all of these sons all over the world now. Um, and I have all of these families that we are, that are a part of our family. I mean, it has, our village is massive and it is amazing. Uh, my children want for nothing, uh, and, and I mean in support and love and encouragement, um, there's nothing. My family is so blessed, and it's because of him, you know, and who he has been. So, um, so that part of it, um, I, 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 I'm grateful for. I think, I think I'm grateful for all of it, because um, it was a, it, it was a, a huge learning experience uh, for me, and I think it made me better. You know, Becky uh, has been, she's been my ride or die as it relates to supporting me uh, with basketball. She was there from the very beginning. I remember uh, sometimes with the police department, we'd make uh, trips and, you know, to go to play other people, and she'd always be there. And uh, But it started with my coaching started with my son, with our son. So, uh, you know, she was right in there as mom. And um, so, you know, everything that had to do with sports, she was either team mom, the organizer, uh, and often my assistant coach, if you ask her. You know, uh, oftentimes she would say, start of a uh, season, she said, I'll see you in uh, February. You know, she had an inside joke of being a basketball widow. Uh, but uh, none of this would have happened without 
her support and backing me. On the next, Bigger Than Basketball. I had actually thought about leaving LaSalle, and I had heard about Coach Lynch through um, a docu-series about him, about like, your guys' team at Price. So um, when I heard he was coming, that changed, that, like, changed my whole perspective. Like, I was like, nah, I want to play for this dude because I see how you rock. Like, his dude's playing defense. Faith and hard work equals success. I never realized how, how that, well, honestly, could give a lot of advice. <laughs> But that, that one was one that he really, really stuck to. Coach Lynch always provided the gym there for me, so that's one of the biggest things. I couldn't get better if I didn't have a gym. I, I've always imagined my dad retiring and hanging it up in Price's gym. It just felt like that was what it was supposed to be. 